Thank you. Good morning, everybody. No, I go. Okay, here I am. I can this one? Okay. So, um, in my talk, I will rather not go into my uh, the science uh, too much in, into science. I will just uh, slightly show you some some uh, ideas what we are working on. But uh, I rather will give you an outlook, an overview on the geothermal development in Central Europe. Um, and uh, would like to say what kind of corresponding concepts we have in order to meet the challenges uh, that these projects are posing to us. Um, of course, um, we are not, we have to stay uh, in a political environment. Uh, currently, we have a huge energy, de energy debate in Germany, and this is how I want to start up. I want to start up telling you what kind of debate and what is the background of discussion that we have. Then I will provide you the geothermal energy projects in the Upper Rheingraben and in Bavaria and provide some research perspectives. Now, this is uh, the primary en energy consumption in Germany from 1990 to 2015. Um, and you see, uh, on that slide, uh, more or less, I don't know, can you see it now? Um, you see this uh, dark, uh, 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 the black uh, um, line, this is coal. Below we have lignite, and um, uh, below we have gases. Um, and uh, these are all, uh, we all have a lot of fossil fuels today. And uh, you see the yellow, bar on the top, which is renewables. Our renewables are currently done through wind and solar in Germany, and uh, there's a lot of uh, um, information on solar and wind, but we just don't focus in our country that we have um, dependency on baseload, and dependency of baseload currently is 87%, and out of these 87%, uh, we have 79% on fossil, still today, and nothing is changing in this country. You, you see the, on this development, uh, we get a little bit more uh, renewable energies uh, and a little bit less nuclear energy. This is the discussion and, uh, of, the, of the government, but the portion of fossil fuel remains and also the dependency on base load capacity or non emittent uh, energy is, uh, continues. We have a strong discussion on the COP21 goals. The um, energy meeting that took place two years ago in Paris and uh, the international law uh, that, we are, um, that we have to follow. Uh, Germany has set up uh, milestones for 2030 and saying that up to 2030 uh, we want to have a reduction of 62% on CO2. Please account that we are deeply depending on fossil. It's a high uh, challenge. Uh, we have uh, the heating of buildings should be reduced by 2030 by 67% on CO2. So here again, there are high political goals that we have, and uh, we, have a uh, we are strongly debating right now um, if we should keep coal. There are strong political lobby groups who are pushing on continuation of coal. Uh, we don't. Uh, develop new grid infrastructure fast enough to bring the wind energy from the north to the south to where the production takes place. And uh, we have a debate on uh, e-mobility, which will increase CO2 because finally we would run our cars with lignite uh, and no more uh, with, uh, uh, with fuel. And uh, this is not very helpful in terms of CO2. But uh, heating is certainly a focus. 30% of the German CO2 emissions is on heating. And we have very little concepts developed in this <coughs> hearing. Now, solution is geothermal, of course. It's renewable, it's sustainable, and I don't have to provide you all the information on this. And uh, it's also optimum for urban areas. So, for example, we are following the track that we can bring down the energy, the solar energy from roofs into the subsurface can heat up subsurface below urban areas up to 200 degrees, 150 degrees. Why not? Why not? 
and then bring up the heat uh, in winter up uh, to, the, um, to the houses again. Because there's a large roof area in a town. It's an enormous roof area that is unused, in, typically on uh, energy uh, uses. But we have challenges. Challenges in geothermal, everybody knows this. Um, high cost, high, uh, starting up course, we have to improve the performance of the systems. We have an uh, environmental impact. Seismicity is a very strong pro problem for us uh, because everyone is mixing up shallow geothermal, deep geothermal, uh, seismicity, uh, uplift, drilling problems. Everything is go, oh, this is geothermal. Uh, and we have a big problem on this issue uh, that the public acceptance uh, is not uh, on a physical-based um, uh, discussion, but it is just a very diffusive uh, uh, discussion that we are leaving. And so public opinion is the major barrier right now in Germany for development of geothermal. So where are we? Where are we in deep geothermal systems in, in Europe? And you see um, these red... Uh, red uh, uh, triangles, which is on heating. We have uh, many heating projects in Paris. Very little, really nobody knows that P Paris is, uh, large parts of Paris are heated by geothermal, uh, especially sub, um, uh, uh, not the central part of Paris, but uh, the, um, uh, the towns around. Um, we have uh, on the Rheingraben, I cannot, can I show this to you here? Uh, this is Paris, here is Paris, here is the project in the Rheingraben that we have in, in Central Europe, and we have the projects in Bavaria. So these are the major geothermal projects areas that we have. Of course, we have all other projects here in Hungary, here. This is a high entropy in uh, um, projects in, in Tuscany that we have, and some very single uh, projects more in the north of Germany. So more or less we have three uh, we have Paris, Rheingraben, and um, Bavaria, um, which are using geothermal uh, right now. Um, with the exception of Ladorello, there are no volcanic heat sources, um, and they are mostly established in uh, heat flow anomalies and high permeable subsurface. Looking a little bit more close to the situation in the Rheingraben, uh, Rheingraben is dividing, um, uh, uh, unifying, let's uh, say, France and Germany. Um, and uh, it has one of the highest temperature anomalies and uh, heat flow anomalies that we have. Uh, it's an active tectonic situation. And uh, the yellow uh, cells that you see here, these are all running projects. Okay, these projects, uh, Sulz is running, uh, Rittershofen in France is running. Uh, they were just uh, inaugurated last year. Then we have Landau, Insheim. Uh, uh, Landau is on, on hold at the moment, but Insheim is running, Bruchsal is running. Brühl was a new borehole. Uh, with very high temperature and very high productivity, uh, more than 100 liters per second, uh, should continue. And we have two more drill sites in Strasbourg that come up. So it's a real development that happens. And we have also associated this with uh, three universities, the University of uh, Strasbourg, KIT, uh, Karlsruhe, where we are here, and in Darmstadt. So we try also to join forces in terms of research um, in this context. Uh, one of the findings, and I just told you we have a major problem is um, seismicity and public acceptance. Uh, so we are investigating uh, what is uh, influence have alteration, alteration, alteration of rock. And it's very helpful. Alteration of rock is help, uh, helpful in terms of permeability, is helpful also in terms of low friction, uh, and mechanical friction. And uh, therefore, it, uh, it has a very good impact on, uh, on seismicity. So we can develop further these projects. We are working also in cyclic injections and other uh, aspects. We want to s develop um, and mitigate uh, seismicity out of geothermal right now. Um, the other example that we have is the Bavarian Molas. The Bavarian Molas is um, so more or less, uh, so we are extracting um, the geothermal heat out of the Malm aquifer here. And the Malm aquifer is in the north of Zur uh, Munich, uh, is at shallow, rather shallow, and the more southward you go towards the Alpine front, uh, the deeper it will get and the higher the temperatures will be. Uh, the Malm aquifer has very high probabilities. 
uh, and allows for flow rates of up to 150 liters per second. So these are huge flow rates and we are facing the problem that we don't have good pumps who can accommodate uh, these high flow rates. But we see that north of Munich we have the possibilities for heating, pure heating projects, and south of Munich we have the possibilities of heating and electricity. Um, in the future, uh, uh, it is planned that all of the district heating system of Munich will be operated on geothermal. So this would be our first um, major town in Europe that has a full supply, or in Central Europe, not in Iceland, uh, it has a full supply of uh, geothermal uh, in its um, district heating system. Uh, what we see here, uh, this is uh, Munich. And uh, you see the triangles and the dots here. These are all projects all around Munich. And we all already have many projects, uh, also starting up new projects here inside Munich. And they all will be connected to the Munich district heating system. Um, and uh, so uh, this has a big, big importance, uh, especially local in Bavaria. And we need to demonstrate that this is also feasible at other parts. Also, we don't have uh, this good uh, uh, um, probabilities or aquifer um, pro properties in other parts of Germany. What we have, uh, of course, uh, not all, we also have troubles. Not every of these systems is working, operating well. Um, and so what we do is, uh, in our group, we go on the mechanics and we in identify um, the mechanical behavior and look on the um, uh, induced fractures and uh, want to uh, identify uh, depths get where we can better stimulate and where we can stimulate less efficiently. But also, in spite of the good probabilities, um, it, um, it is a, a public acceptance of these projects typically is not a problem because everybody is benefiting. Everybody need, sees that he has a benefit out of the dis district heating system. But anyhow, journalists show up when there is a small seismic event, it will show up on the first page of a newspaper. Uh, and also here again, we have to, um, uh, uh, we have to, to overcome the uh, challenges in public acceptance. What are we doing? What are we intending? We intend to elaborate uh, a research lab, a real scale research lab. Um, I just showed you the um, graben structure. So the rock that is in five kilometer depth in reservoir scale can be, um, uh, can be targeted uh, on the flanks of the graben uh, at surface. So we can make uh, mining facilities and we want to have high flow rate uh, experiments in this mining facility. We already developed uh, tests and experiments in ESPE in Sweden and uh, nuclear, nuclear waste facilities, uh, but we want to do this in a real reservoir rock environment. And um, one of the key challenges is, I mean, just on a simple hydrogeological basis, uh, what flow conditions do we have? Uh, flow conditions are certainly not Darcian. Darcian is for sublaminar flow, but when we are injecting 100 liters, 50 liters per second, it is out of scope that we still can deal with um, Darcy flow um, in this context. So we want to investigate uh, the coupling between mechanics, hydraulics, thermal, what is the heat transfer. Uh, all these things is what we want to investigate in terms of this GeoLab project. What we need we need a research well here. Uh, we need a fractured environment. This is a reservoir rock in the Black Forest that uh, we have. And we have a three-dimensional dim coverage of all the measurements. So we want to include these measurements together. So what happens is we want to have here a gallery. Out of this gallery, we will drill uh, boreholes, uh, observe monitoring boreholes. Uh, then we have an, another borehole from the surface that intersects a fault zone here. We inject fluid and we are going to monitor seismicity, electromagnetic fields, um, whatever we want to uh, have and we want to improve and understand the situation in crystalline rock. Um, 
So the challenges is are not only what is done in nuclear waste, so it's a, this parameter distribution and, and a function of, of um, uh, space. So, a fun, but we, since our parameters will change um, with time, so it is uh, a variation in space and in time. One, uh, so this is uh, some parameters change that I want to show you here, but I don't want to go in detail. But one of the issues I want to go uh, here is what happens to the fluid? When we inject, I mean, in Zulz, for example, we had an uh, injection of 28,000 cubic meters of fluid in the host truck. Where does it stay? Where is, uh, where is it go going? 28,000 cubic meters of fluid in a fractured rock with a mean per, uh, porosity of, let's say, 1%. I mean, who are really targeting a, a large amount of the rock. And uh, we have strong indications that um, volume the higher the volume is, the higher the stimulation success will be. And this is what we see in the field in Zulz. So this is what we want to repeat uh, in our GeoLab. Uh, Geo and we want to improve stimulation efficiency. Um, another story is uh, we are, our KIT is in the Rheingraben. And uh, KIT is split up into the Campus South, which is the old university, and the Campus North, which is the Helmholtz Center. Uh, and uh, below this former Helmholtz Center, we have the highest temperature anomaly in Germany, which is more than 170 degrees in three kilometer depths. So it's really something very, very important. And uh, <clears throat> so we have in the campus uh, an existing infrastructure, an existing district heating uh, grid, and we have a demand, a whole year demand for research. Uh, so it is not that only in summertime, but uh, in wintertime we have the demand in heating, but you have it in summertime. And, um, and so we want to improve, uh, we want to run the system in terms also of public acceptance. Public acceptance is important. I mean, when we show that we have competence, we have high competence in research to understand the processes. Therefore, we need, we need a geolab. We need these uh, uh, three-dimensional understanding of the processes, but we need also something, a success that we can show to a politician and say, okay, look, here is a good example. We need this demonstrator. Uh, and urgently, really urgently. Uh, the chances that we have, moreover, in campus is that we can combine this with other renewables. We have lots of renewable energy research at KIT. So we, have, we want to have storage. We want to have solar system, solar energy is stored we want to have biomass stored subsurface. We want to use biomass as peak load um, <coughs> for peak load applications. So we have a, a large variety of applications in the campus. Um, let me see. So the conclusions on geothermal. We need, of course, favorable settings. I mean, hydraulic is clearly on the, over the, the most important uh, uh, setting. And uh, very, very often, it is not sufficient, the natural permeability. Um, it is sufficient in Bavaria. It was sufficient in uh, Paris, but it's not sufficient in the Rheingraben. Here we have to make simulation, simulations with little uh, seismicity. Uh, temperature, we have large temperature anomalies, uh, which are world-class anomalies even, um, in non-volcanic systems. Um, and in a graben system, we have a critical stressed faults. Okay, so we have to be careful. We always have to be careful. Geothermal is baseload. Munich, Paris, Basel, uh, I didn't go into the Basel, um, demonstrate the feas feasibility of uh, these systems. And uh, what we need is a professional development and improved level of fundamental science in this context also. Um, one nice example, I hope, Maria, I don't know. Um, uh, uh, you don't have this example. I learned this from e Isor in, in Sweden. Uh, what was the history of geothermal in Iceland? I mean, it was not given from uh, always that everybody wanted to go, oh, you have to go into geothermal. There was a large battle in Iceland as well, as far as I understood. Um, so uh, Reykjavik was uh, heated with coal, and they had uh, very bad air conditions in the past. And uh, they improved the air conditions strongly through using geothermal. 
No, today we have the challenges on the greenhouse gas emission. I mean, every year we are reaching new records in uh, CO2 uh, content in the atmosphere. And uh, I make the exercises with my students. And every year I have to give a new number. Uh, it's a terrible, terrible situation. But it's like this. I mean, uh, greenhouse gas emission increase, and we don't know. We are facing a big challenge, and we don't know what we, are we going to do next in future. So in this context, I think geothermal might be a solution. I uh, thank you very much, and um, I hope I could give you a kind of overview on the challenges and on the successes that we have in Central Europe in geothermal. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for inviting me, Morris, to attend today's event. I really appreciate the support that the University of Waterloo and the support staff, Iris Armigan, have given me in ensuring that I came here safely and I'm, and I'm, and I'm able to talk to you this morning. Um, so I, I'm the Professor and Executive Director of the Thornton Energy Institute um, in the UK. Okay? So one of, this, one of the things I really want to reflect upon today is the issue of the geothermal position within the geo energy economy. And one of the things I want to try and articulate to you this morning is a value proposition that I think we have. And a value proposition that I think we have that maybe other international researchers, be they in Canada or be they in the rest of the world, might wish to critically, constructively reflect upon as I go through the presentation. Morris and colleagues from the, from the first panel, I was really struck by some of the issues that you were raising there, and I was just making some notes and demonstration project kept coming up. I'll try and cover some of that off today in mine. Skills, innovation, regulation, research as industry, um, public communication of science and public engagement, and indeed, the company Shell got mentioned as well. So I'm very proud to be the professor and executive director at the Thornton Energy Institute that was the former Shell research and development facility within the UK. It's a 66-acre site with 1.1 million square feet of space with a specific focus on energy. Shell divested of the site about four and a half years ago, and my university, the University of Chester, took on this particular site. The University of Chester that's world-renowned for doing theology and teaching and humanities decided that it wanted to open up an engineering faculty the first engineering faculty in the UK for over 10 years, with a specific focus on energy. Morris, colleagues, my background is very much a red brick institution within the UK. Okay? Red brick through and through. 12 years at the University of Manchester, six years as professor and head of environmental engineering at Queen's University, Belfast. But I saw this press release about the University of Chester acquiring this site. And do you know what? It really intrigued me the opportunity to work in a world-class research facility beyond what you could ever imagine that a traditional red brick university could have within the UK. The demand and the aspiration to work interchangeably on energy with industry was just a challenge that I couldn't resist. So off I went to the University of Chester. 1.1 million square feet of office space, 66 acres of land. Been there for three years now. What have we achieved in that particular time? Brand new faculty, mechanical, electrical, chemical engineering, maths, and uh, some chemistry. In that time, recruited 700 students. Our first graduates went through last year. 100 members of faculty and university staff on our site. But that only covers a third of our site. The other two thirds, what do you do with it? You get industry into it. So at the moment, we have 35 companies on our site employing 700 private sector um, people. Companies, major companies like the Wood Group, a world-leading well integrity group. GHD, a world-leading consultancy in energy engineering. Shell Global Solutions have moved back onto our site to have a branch within, within the UK. And a whole series of smaller companies. And do you know what's great about that? They want to work interchangeably with faculty, throwing challenges at the students, helping the curriculum develop, to develop science to then inform into the undergraduate curriculum. And the companies want to take on these students to do placements with them so that our students become more industry ready. So here, a destination-led example of skills, innovation, and growth. But where are we? 
I'm sure many of you will think Chester. Now, that is somewhere in the UK, but I'm not quite sure where. Well, let's see if I can show you. Chester. Yeah, remember that? Chester. Okay, there. Chester is there. Now, the geo energy economy around Chester, or the geo energy proposition around Chester, is immense. Think about the Industrial Revolution. Let me take you back 240, 250 years. Where did it begin? It began in the northwest of England. What was one of the key drivers behind that? Salt. We have the largest salt caverns in the UK, in Cheshire, near Crewe, near Nantwich. I'll come back onto that in a little while. Geothermal. Again, near Crewe, we have a very hot scene there. And there are proposals at the moment, funded by the European Union with the UK government and industry, ONGI, GDF Suez, to pull together a geothermal uh, well in and around uh, Cheshire. Coal bed methane. We have the only commercially viable coal bed methane plants in the UK near Chester. Associated with that, we have hot water in the coal seams, and the many coal seams in and around the area, and I'll come back to reflect upon some of the science that we're doing in that space in a little while. Shale. Don't know if I'm allowed to talk about shale today, but we have a shed load of shale underneath our feet, and we're going to have some world-leading facilities around, around that. Carbon capture and storage. Offshore here in the East Irish Sea, we have a gas field which is about to be decommissioned, and we're currently doing quite a lot of work looking at the potential around that to do some modeling and to do some simulation work and ultimately a demonstrator around carbon storage in the area. Coal gasification, coal seams. And ultimately, I chair something called the Northwest Hydrogen Hub, I'm on, and I'm looking at the possibility around methane and steam to do some steam methane reforming to drive the hydrogen economy in the area. Two platforms I want to talk about. We're home to the UK Geo Observation Platform, and we're leading on, as I say, we're leading on the decarbonisation of gas agenda within the UK. So here we are. Here's a close-up version of where we are. Chester's down here. This is the Thornton Science Park here. And around this particular coast, some major industries. Ineos over here, Vauxhall over here, Urenco, Uranium Enrichment Company here, the second largest oil refinery in the UK here, the largest bottle manufacturer in the UK here, the largest manufacturer of uh, fertilizers in the UK, consuming 2% of UK gas, CF fertilizers there. 5% of UK energy consumed within five miles of my site. What a wonderful place to be a professor and leader on energy. It's an amazing facility, an amazing opportunity. So one of the things I want to talk about today is the Thornton UK Geo Energy Observation platform. Announced today, but some people in the room will know of this because there has been much deliberation and discussion about it over the last three years. But funding has been secured and it's gone live today. So it's wonderful to be here to talk about this. This is concerned with a whole swathe of different uh, subsurface opportunities, not least the subsurface associated with geothermal. And it's going to be a world-leading national facility looking at a whole series of subsurface opportunities. So let's look at the issue of the subsurface in relation to the low carbon transition. This has been mentioned by a couple of speakers already this morning. What are the geothermal opportunities? Well, you can see them there, the hot, dry rock opportunities, mostly within the UK associated with the southwest and in Cornwall, the district heating opportunities associated with geothermal. There are a couple of case studies within the UK. Southampton is the one that particularly springs to mind. Uh, and then mine water heating, one of the key issues that we want to drive at Thornton, but also opportunities up in Scotland. Compressed air, that's already been covered off. Shale gas, I've mentioned. Methane and the opportunities associated with methane. Hydrogen, I mentioned that, CCS. But for the UK at the moment, the critical questions that government are asking of industry and of academia is, what's the potential of these? Is there potential? What's the economic potential? What's the market potential? What's the skills potential? What's the innovation potential around these? All those key issues that I thought some of the people were asking during the first, during the first uh, session. 
Can we do these things sustainably? Question mark. What are the scientific questions around these? What are the facilities that we need to answer these particular questions? And that's what the UK Geo Energy Innovation Platform is all, all about. So geothermal within the UK goes back a long time. Bath Spa, all heard of it. This is the sort of amount that it flows every day. Historic site within the UK. Um, bit of history for you. Current geothermal activities in the UK. Uh, this is a slide that I've appropriated and added to from Tony Batchelor in it. I'd really recommend that you look at some of Tony Batchelor's work. He's probably seen as being the leading geothermal commentator in the UK. His profile's quite high. He's been doing a lot of YouTube videos, been doing a number of uh, activities. The downside of Tony, if I'm, if I'm constructively critical of him, whilst, he's a great, whilst I'm a great fan and advocate, he is really closely associated with industry, so many people see him as having an industrial slant. I'm lucky, I'm a neutral, impartial academic, a professor, I can get up and say things and, and be constructive around that. The sites that I've listed there are really the key sites within the UK that are currently engaged with or trying to engage with geothermal within, 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 the, uh, within the country. One of the key debates that are coming out from the research community as the UK Geo Pro Geo Energy Project uh, evolve. Well, one of the issues that's already been mentioned is the whole notion of decarbonisation of heat and the opportunities afforded by geothermal to decarbonise. Meeting the Paris Protocols and the climate commitments for the UK and for the rest of the world around the geothermal is really an opportunity. A second area that concerns the UK right now is the issue of air quality. And geothermal provides us potentially with a platform for making power cleaner. The issue of intermittency, that's been raised. Many disruptive technologies are beginning to emerge on the market around renewables, but there is a consistent platform associated with uh, geothermal. Help us to meet commitments to the environment and We've already heard this morning from the first session from Canada how potentially it can store energy in a much more successful and effective way throughout the whole of the year. So I don't want to go into that very much. I've gone backwards. No, I haven't. So the UK Geo Energy Observatory. There are two sites that have been announced today, and I'm going to take you. I'm going to show you a link in a minute to these particular sites. Okay. The first one, the first site to be announced. Uh, today is associated with Scotland, the Clyde Gateway in Glasgow. And this is to look at geothermal work associated with former mine workings in the east end of Glasgow. Uh, and that's to look at and to understand the science around that and to support industry engaging with that platform to develop commercial projects, to develop commercial products that can ultimately be marketed to generate science that can cascade down into undergraduate, postgraduate curricula and CPD activities. To export that knowledge and those technologies to the rest of the world to add and benefit to UK PLC. That's what the UK Research Councils are about at the moment. The second project, just by me at the Inns Marshes on the Thornton Science Park, is much more concerned with deep geology. Yes, geothermal's in there, but there's also the opportunities associated with coal, uh, um, carbon capture and storage, and shale that I've gone into. So what science will be done around geothermal on this pl platform in the UK? Well, the Clyde Gateway is going to be the key research platform. About £10 million worth of research funding is going into that on a capital program, £10 million worth of capital program, and then there'll be a number of calls over the next three years to do science on that particular platform. Each call will be circa £5 million. These are the critical questions that the scientists have come up with in the UK, working again on science advisory councils with industry, refereed by international panel experts, ensuring that it aligns with the government's scientific um, priorities that are outlined in the industrial strategy. Each government department in the UK has a chief scientific advisor, which helps to steer uh, the government policy. So it's about making sure that UK science fits in with where the government and where the UK economy is going to in, in the future. If taxpayers are contributing towards the funding for science, 
I genuinely believe that the taxpayer should expect a return on that investment back into the country's coffers and into the exchequer. Okay, how much longer have we got? Two minutes, okay. On the public communication of science, the data on this platform or on this research will be available uh, to all. To all. So you can look at the data that's being generated virtually in real time. And on the platforms, you can see what is being done in real time on those particular platforms. So the launch for science has now come out. And the launch for science, as I just click on that, and hopefully it will go to it. You're going to have to bear with me because it should go to it. So the launch of science, 26th of September, 2017. That's today. Very timely, Morris. Thank you for inviting me to speak today. That's gone live today on the, on the UK Natural Environment Research Council's website, concerned with eyes and ears for the underground. That's a capital program, but associated with that, there's a research program that's got a call out for research grants in the first phase for up to six and a half million pounds. It's all contained on my presentation, so you can access this later. So, Chair, if I, if I may, my final slide is where does the position of geothermal and where does the position of the subsurface lie in the future? Well, we've heard an awful lot today about geothermal, and I think it's great, but I just think it's part of a broader solution. I think there's a need for us to consider where geothermal fits into the wider geoenergy mix and the wider sustainability mix. Uh, it's part of the decarbonisation shift, but there is a pressing need to consider the interlinkages between different dimensions. The shale, the uh, geothermal, the salt caverns, the carbon capture and storage, the mine water heating, you name it, there's a whole swathe of subsurface opportunities. Link that to uh, issues of the hydrogen economy, the, hydro, the, uh, the uh, hydro economy, a whole series of things. How do we begin to link all this together? And where does the position of storage fit into that? How then can we take those technologies and innovate them to ensure that they're commercialized? How do we take the science to communicate it to the public? How do we take that science to communicate it to undergraduates and CPDs? How do we engage with regulators and government and international bodies to ensure that we deliver world-leading science? And that's my talk. Thank you very much. Uh, so my name is Maria Gudjansdottir, and I'm an assistant professor at the School of Science and Engineering at Reykjavik University. I'm a mechanical engineer. And uh, I will be do my best to compress the geothermal development in Iceland into a 15-minute presentation. So thank you very much, University of Waterloo, for uh, inviting me here. And uh, I'm happy to discuss uh, geothermal uh, uh, matters. Uh, and uh, I will start by bringing you back to the year 1933, and this is actually the same photo as Thomas showed in the, one of the earlier, uh, earlier presentations, but this is just to emphasize the, uh, the difference uh, that we have made in the la last decades. So this is uh, the coal smoke covering the, uh, at that time, small and, uh, and primitive uh, village of Reykjavik, which is now the capital city of Iceland. Uh, because there, everyone is uh, burning coal to, to heat other houses. Uh, the same spot here, uh, 75 years later, and uh, it's clear sky, because we are now heating houses using geothermal energy. Uh, this actually was a, a political debate. This is a, a front page of a newspaper from 1938 in Iceland, where there's a municipality election, and uh, from the Sea Party, where they are basically telling people to vote them, because they will bring them uh, district heating instead of the uh, heating with coal and then going from these black days into the blue clear skies. So people were really concerned about uh, air quality in those years as well as today. So uh, what has happened since uh, this was, uh, these photos were taken? So now the primary energy used in Iceland is uh, uh, primarily from geothermal because we use it for heating as well as for electricity production. And uh, now we uh, heat up our houses, 90% uh, uh, of the homes are, are heated, heated using geothermal energy, 
and the re remaining 10% from uh, elect electrical heating. And uh, well, there are maybe 30 homes in Iceland that are heated using, uh, uh, using oil because they are not col connected to the electrical grid or district heating systems. Uh, when it comes to electricity, um, it's 25% of uh, the electricity production in Iceland is, used, is using geothermal uh, energy or converting uh, thermal energy from, from geothermal. Uh, and the, uh, more or less the rest, the 75% is from hydro. So we are producing uh, all our electricity using hydro and geothermal. So uh, this is just a, a fun fact here. Uh, I hope you can see this uh, figure uh, good because uh, the blue bars there show the cost that we are paying for geothermal heating and the red bars are showing the equivalent costs if we were using oil to heat up our houses. So given that uh, we would, the, the, there would be the same prices. So this is just to show you that uh, uh, we are maybe quite spoiled by the low price of uh, geothermal energy in Iceland. And you can basically tell if it's an Icelander or not. If there's warm or cold inside a, a room, the Icelander will just open and close the window and do nothing with the radiator. It's not maybe a very good thing, but uh, uh, it tells a lot about the reality. So uh, our... Uh, resource uh, is, uh, of course, abundant, and we are blessed by the fact that we have a lot of high temperature uh, resources available. And uh, due to the fact that Iceland lies on the Atlantic Ridge, on the divergent uh, boundaries, so there is a lot of uh, volcanic uh, activity, and uh, the di divergent heat, uh, or di di divergent uh, plate boundaries are uh, creating uh, fractures and permeability, and we have good access to the heat source coming from magma and intrusions. Uh, so these three things together, heat, permeability, and water present to uh, bring us the energy to the surface, uh, uh, enables us to utilize the geothermal energy. So this map here shows, uh, uh, all the dots show where we have uh, geothermal fields, the red ones, the high temperature, which may be suitable for uh, electricity production. Oh, only a few of them have been utilized because many of them are in the highlands and in protected areas. And the small black dot shows where we have low temperature areas that might be suitable for direct use and heating. Uh, this, is, uh, this map shows where we are actually using uh, geothermal energy for various purposes. For example, the red dots are for district heating systems throughout the country. So Reykjavik is located on the pen, uh, close to the peninsula in the southwest there. And uh, just a few words about the uh, electricity production. So the uh, numbered dots there are showing where we have uh, uh, geothermal power plants. And uh, it's not a surprise that uh, they are basically located very close to the uh, plate boundaries, so we have good access to, to the uh, heat sources. So uh, this is uh, just a few figures showing the, uh, the uh, power plants here. This is Nesia uh, which was developed in the, uh, in the 90s, and Hadley uh, Sede was developed the last decade. Uh, this study here will become online uh, very soon. It's a new power plant in the north of Iceland. And then we have Reykjanes from the last decade as well. And Svarts Enki, which is, uh, uh, was a, uh, uh, started in, in the 70s. And actually the Blue Lagoon, which some of you might know from Icelandic uh, tourist brochures. Uh, it's an, a result of that power plant because it's using the affluent water from the power plant uh, to bathe in. So, uh, but we are... a uh, small island with 330,000 uh, inhabitants and uh, a lot of energy resources. Uh, we're not connected to the electrical grid in, in uh, any other country, so that means that if we want to utilize the energy sources, then we have to have someone available to buy that and use that electricity. And uh, the last decades there have been a lot of, uh, or, or a couple of uh, aluminium uh, industry plants that have been built in Iceland that are power-intensive industry and use electricity for uh, uh, producing aluminium. So just a few words about uh, uh, how to explore and uh, utilize the heat sources and the geothermal. Uh, we will not do anything uh, except we are following policy and regulation. And these are, of course, more than scientific and, uh, and technical issues. Uh, early exploration uh, uh, involves various uh, disciplines. 
and as well as when we have done the exploration, uh, we go for drilling, and there people have to communicate and talk together and uh, compare the results together in order to make a decision on when to, where to drill. And uh, for the production, uh, it's very important that we have a, a very good uh, reservoir management. So don't, don't, don't just sit back and then watch the electricity being produced. Uh, make sure that the reservoir is uh, responder, responding in the matter that we want. So this is all integrated models and involves people from, with, with very various backgrounds. Um, just a few words about uh, what uh, we can do with the uh, water or the fluid that we get from the uh, geothermal reservoirs. Uh, it's a Lintal diagram uh, showing the temperature scales here in Celsius. So uh, for lower temperatures, uh, the water or the fluid is more suitable for direct use, like heating up houses and uh, bathing in it for households, etc. But once the temperature go up, goes up the scale, uh, uh, the fluid might be more suitable for electricity production, that is, converting the thermal energy into electrical power. So, a uh, little bit about the direct use. Uh, we've been, uh, I think, touching some of these points in earlier uh, presentations here. Uh, thermal energy using the, uh, or direct use means uh, using the thermal energy directly for house heating, for example, and uh, heat pumps are, of course, direct use of geothermal energy. And there are uh, many, many other applications that we can use the thermal energy for. Just to name a few here, uh, is growing uh, fish. This is, for example, the Senegalese sole, which has natural habitats in uh, southern regions uh, in the world. But we can grow them in Iceland in those harsh environments, inside the house, of course. But uh, we are using uh, geothermal water to heat up uh, fresh water for them to grow in. And then uh, drying of fish, uh, we export uh, dried fish to Nigeria, for example. Um, and we grow uh, flowers and vegetables in, in greenhouses uh, that uh, otherwise would need to be imported into the snowy winter days. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a great thing here, snow melting systems. On an icy day, it's very good to have the pavements heated. So you actually are using the... Uh, retour water from the, from the houses uh, for this purpose, so this can be very convenient, as you can see, uh, and probably applicable uh, in many places in Canada as well. Uh, and uh, this is my favorite application of geothermal, is the swimming pools. In Iceland, there's love swimming, but by swimming we mean uh, uh, relaxing in the hot tub in the uh, cold winter days. So, um, the power production, you've seen some of these uh, uh, mentioned today. Uh, when we have high temperature resources, we can use the, either the steam directly or separating the water and the steam and using the steam. Or we can use the thermal energy in order to heat up another fluid with lower boiling points in a binary system. So it might be more suitable for medium and low temperatures. Uh, and uh, there are new op opportunities because there are... Uh, not only the uh, Paris Agreement, uh, there's also that the EU is uh, uh, committing to reduce emissions. Uh, so there might be a market for Icelandic electricity in, in, uh, in the mainland of Europe. Uh, and there's a possibility to bring a, an uh, interconnector or subsea cable from Iceland to Europe. Uh, but there com comes, of course, with high technical risk. But uh, that way, Iceland could be connected to the electrical grid in the mainland or, or in Europe. Uh, we have also seen, a, of course, foreseeing a, a big market opportunity for, uh, 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 for the uh, transportation sector in Iceland. That is, uh, this blue line there, the upper blue line, shows the new registration of uh, electrical vehicles in Iceland. So we see, although there are some uh, peaks for different months there, but uh, we see that this is a development that is not going to stop, so we'll be uh, probably changing a lot of our vehicles from oil to, to electricity in the next years. Um, geothermal utilization comes, of course, with a, a lot of challenges uh, that have to be overcome. Uh, it, uh, we very rarely get the fluid in a pure form from the reservoirs. Uh, there are a lot of dissolved minerals and gases there. Uh, for example, silica, uh, the whitest powder there in the pipeline, comes from a high temperature source there. Uh, the 
dots there show uh, H2S, hydrogen sulfide uh, concentration in Reykjavik, and the peak there is for a certain uh, wind direction when the wind is blowing from a nearby power plant, but is, however, not exceeding any, any health limits, fortunately. Um, we have also the introduced seismicity, and uh, this graph there shows uh, some seismic events due to reinjection. Uh, and uh, we, of course, have to just be careful with that and, and inform people about these possibilities. Uh, reservoir monitoring and production at sustainable level is, of course, very important. That is to, to uh, sustain the, uh, the flow rates uh, through the coming years. Um, I'd like to mention some geothermal projects that we are uh, 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 working on at Reykjavik University. Uh, so uh, I'm a co-leader of a geothermal group where we are uh, doing optimal operation of uh, geothermal energy utilization. So there are many uh, points that we are, are touching there. Uh, how does a geothermal system react to utilization? We're kind of uh, optimizing uh, the uh, reservoir condition or the uh, production from our reservoirs. We have a number of uh, PhD students and master students uh, and currently it's an ongoing project uh, called Data Fusion in Geothermal Exploration, where we are trying to f fuse the different uh, exploration data together to, in order to make a conceptual model and, and uh, make a better decision about uh, uh, where to drill and reduce risk. And uh, we are also uh, involved in a project uh, related to the Icelandic deep drilling project. I don't know if you know about that, where we are, where we are uh, the aim is to drill into deeper reservoirs, maybe four or five kilometers deep, in order to get uh, uh, steam with higher energy density. So in that case, we could have up to 10 times higher power from a single valve than from uh, traditional ones. But that comes, of course, with many challenges like fluid handling, silica deposition and corrosion. So this is a photo here taken from a power company, HS Orca, from the ITDP2 well, which has, uh, was recently completed in uh, 4,659 meters. And we are now waiting for the discharge test to see what kind of a fluid we get. Um, so uh, Reykjavik University and Canada, we have here in the audience two students, uh, Casey and uh, Andrea. Uh, that are doing a master project at the Iceland School of Energy, which is a, a, a master pro uh, project for, uh, within Reykjavik University. So uh, they have posters here, and uh, feel free to, to uh, talk to them and, and discuss some opportunities. They are both from Canada and have been living in Iceland for the last months. Uh, we uh, have, of course, a lot of... Uh, experience in geothermal and uh, we have had the opportunity to educate many people, for example, through the Iceland School of Energy and also through the uh, United Nations University geothermal program that has been operating since uh, 1979. So we have people from all around the world, from developing countries coming to Iceland to, to learn from professionals there and building a, a good network of uh, geothermal people. So my last slide here is uh, just uh, some take home messages. For all of us, uh, just to keep exploring possibilities and be open to synergies. So what might be a waste energy for uh, one industry might be a source for another. For example, uh, the Blue Lagoon example. And uh, we should share the knowledge. Don't let uh, other people do the same mistake that you did, but inform others. Uh, it's a geothermal uh, area is a very small community, so very international, so it's important that we meet and uh, share uh, ideas. And uh, also foster the links between industry research and training. Uh, the industry is uh, closely related to the academia, and uh, we have students working on actual projects. I think that's very important. And of course, uh, uh, reviewing our operating models for all the reservoirs so we uh, can withstand uh, or, or can have a sustainable productions. So uh, I'd like to just thank you for your attention and show you this uh, figure, we could, uh, this photo, which is actually the winner of the uh, GRC annual meeting uh, photo contest. It's a French guy called Bastien Po that uh, took this uh, excellent photo from Hatlis uh, and uh, the Lift power plant. So it combines two things that are very uh, popular thing to visit and see in Iceland, that is geothermal uh, and the Northern Lights. So, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. 
I was thinking last night that this is my semi-centennial visit to the University of Waterloo. The last time I was here was as a high school student from near Hamilton in 1967. And unless the frequency of my visits in increases, this is my last visit. <laughs> and I want to thank everyone for making it so nice. But I would like to talk about um, um, an actual demonstration project that is going on in the United States. It's more of an R&D project, but uh, I think demonstration falls into that category. And this is uh, what is called the FORGE program, sponsored by the Department of Energy um, um, in the United States. And basically, this is a program to promote research on enhanced geothermal systems. And you heard Dr. Dusso this morning mention uh, enhanced geothermal systems. So let's look at what we've got. We have conventional geothermal systems where we have a situation where we have heat, we have convective motion of fluids carrying that heat to closer to the surface where we can extract that through a borehole, bring that to the surface and we can convert it to energy by organic Rankine cycle or, or direct uh, um, um, use of a turbine. Um, the alternative is enhanced geothermal system. This is similar to this, that you have the heat, but you don't have the fracture network to produce the fluids, and you don't have the fluids in place. So basically what the procedure is, is to provide uh, the opportunity to create a reservoir in situ by hydraulically fracturing, say, between two wells, circulating cold water down one well, producing that water through the, through the fractured network, increasing the heat, producing it out of the other fracture, and flashing it to steam, driving a turbine, or whatever your uh, 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 power application project is. Now this is not new, and as was pointed out this morning, this has got a maybe, a, um, uh, this has also got a 40 to 50 year pedigree in terms of EGS programs that have been tried throughout the world. And this figure from uh, Tester and, and, and later from uh, uh, Breed and, and colleagues demonstrates that there have been about 13 or 14 of these projects that have gone on as demonstration projects or scientific applications throughout the world since the middle, middle 70s. Unfortunately, we still have a long way to go on these because uh, although we are producing power from some of them, salts in particular, I think that uh, the power that's being produced is relatively smaller than we, what we've been looking for, and that the heat recoveries are not substantial and the flow rates are relatively low. That being said, these have been scientifically landmark projects that have really laid the groundwork for the success of EGS in, in the future. These also have been somewhat dominated by natural fractures, and the funding entity here is looking for something that is largely a conductive network and does not rely substantially on natural fractures. So, where do we go from this? What, are, what, is, our, what is our resolution? Well, we've demonstrated from these things that there are a lot of problems. And I'd like to contest some of the things I heard in the first panel. The problems that we're demonstrating, even including, even including seismicity, are techno-economic issues. Uh, it, not so much policy issues, certainly not in the United States. We've had tremendous support from state and federal entities. And I think that really for EGS to become successful, we have to demonstrate that it can be done effectively, and it can be done economically, and it can be done over a 30-year time cycle. And, and so, this brings up a number of problems here that we won't have time to talk today, but these are tremendous research applications for, uh, for any sort of uh, academic or industrial entities and, and are well meriting um, of federal funding for, for looking at all of these. So what is the resolution? Well, <laughs> it sounds like a broken record here, but one of the resolutions is coming up with demonstration facilities that can establish that this can work and provide a metric for uh, overcoming some of these technical issues. And so the Department of Energy funded, initially, five locations in the western part of the United States. Western part of the United States is blessed with high thermal gradients, and so geothermal is a legitimate possibility in many of these places. 
That was down-selected. That's, I learned that's a government term. You down-select from five to two, and now there are two left. There are two men standing or women standing or persons standing. One is a site that I'm going to talk about in Milford, Utah, and the second is a site in Fallon, Nevada, that is being operated uh, uh, by Sandia National Laboratories. Come March of next year, there will be a final selection process that will start to determine where the overall uh, Department of Energy's um, EGS field laboratory will be located. So the principle here, and they're fundamentally similar in both of these entities, is to drill um, an inclined geothermal well and to access temperatures somewhere in the neighborhood of 175 to 200 C. Higher if you can get it, but not much higher because of uh, the degradation of drilling components and, uh, and pumping equipment and things like that. You'll drill one of these wells and you'll cement it and case it. After that, that well will be hydraulically fractured. And in this particular case, we're only going to hydraulically fracture right at the very end of the well, what we call the toe of the well. And we'll measure microseismicity, and we'll have other monitoring methods to infer grossly where these fractures are growing. Once we can infer where these hydraulic fractures have grown from this first well, we'll drill a second well to try and intersect those fractures so that you've completed your circuit, that you can inject fluid down um, one well, cold fluid, produce it through um, a network of natural fractures, recover it th through the second well. Now notice I only said th that the extreme end of this well is going to be stimulated uh, because that will leave maybe $120 million that will be administered for research in ge enhanced geothermal um, energy in this particular well. And we're open for business, Canada, United States, Iceland, Germany, even, and I understand I'm supposed to say Chester, Maybe, maybe that's not right, but it's, cl it's close enough. Anyways, and so that's the principle here, and we'll just talk about where we're phasing it, now, phasing it now. So I didn't know where Chester is, and most people here may not know where Utah is. You know, it's kind of near Colorado, okay, and it doesn't much matter. But the big deal about this slide is that it's showing within the area that we've selected, we already are lucky enough to have three producing power plants. INEL, an Italian company, is producing at Cove Fort, uh, CIRC, um, uh, a U.S. company, is producing um, at uh, well, what used to be called Thermo, and uh, Rocky Mountain Power or Pacific Corp, um, a Berkshire Hathaway company, by the way, is producing at Blundell, the Roosevelt Hot Springs system. So it's a, it's a situation where, hey, you know there's a lot of power there, and also you know that there aren't going to be too many environmental restrictions because this is where it's located. Uh, we had to go through uh, um, environmental evaluations looking for endangered species or whatever. Unfortunately, there was a fire that went here th in through here in about 2006. So anything that was endangered uh, was terminated at that point. And so the site is actually quite good. Uh, there are uh, some species close, but it meets environmental criteria for, um, uh, for drilling wells in a geothermal system. There's been a wealth of data that's gone on here. In the 70s, all of the ge big geothermal companies, Philips and all of those companies, were looking for geothermal energy in this particular area. And that's, in fact, the heritage for the Blundell power plant, which is very close to here, which produces, I, I think, 30 megawatts of electricity. So lots of information available. It's a, it's a great geologic setting. It's got tertiary intrusives uh, um, that are affording um, a very high geothermal gradient, maybe 60 degrees C um, per kilometer. And so a great location in terms of heat, a great location in terms of environmental capabilities. The stresses are favorable for hydraulic fracturing. This is in a basin and range environment which is extensional and that means that the hydraulic fractures are going to all tend in this particular case to approximately run north-south. And so if you're creating hydraulic fractures, one of the biggest problems in these is creating a consistent network of fractures because you have to have multiple fractures in these wells to come up with a commercial plant. And so fracture geometry is governed by in situ stress conditions. Tremendous in situ stress uh, in in situ thermal environment. What you can see here is a compilation of some of the data from multiple facilities, multiple wells that have been drilled in this particular area. And you can see some where there's a very steep, uh, 
gradient in temperature. Those are the convective systems. Basically, that hot fluid has been carried up from, from depth. Okay? And we don't want that. We don't want a convective system. Our system falls in a conductive environment where heat conduction is, uh, is dominant, and we're going to rely on the, on the hydraulic fractures to take the energy from that conductive fluid system. And in fact, what it turns out is that, oops, is that there is a fault called the opal mount fault. And remarkably, it's convective on one side of that fault and dominantly conductive on the other side of the fault, that there is a hydrologic barrier on that, and we're drilling on the west side of that fault where it is, it is conductive. So it's a very nice system. Also, it's a relatively aseismic area, which is important. Okay? You know, one of the questions this morning about putting a geothermal operation on a university campus, it sounds like a good idea until somebody asks you about seismicity. And they'll bring to mind Basel or whatever, and so there's often a lot of resistance. Even in a closed system where you're injecting down one well and bringing up into another, that seismicity will ultimately become an, area, uh, um, um, an issue. And so we're in a syst um, an area where uh, it's relatively aseismic. So, what have we got in this particular, what have we done so far? Well, basically we have just, and I mean just, like today we are uh, rigging down uh, the drill rig, drilled a scientific well to about 2,300 meters uh, to take thermal measurements, to take in situ stress measurements, and uh, um, to set forth in developing numerical models to characterize this particular site. A tremendous learning experience. Hats off to people that have drilled geothermal wells. The drilling is really, really complicated. And if some of the technologies like the hammer drilling or whatever can be extrapolated to this industry, it's going to make a tremendous difference. One of the bigger capital investments in these, drilling these wells is going to be drill bits and drilling motors and in being able to tolerate drilling in hard rock at extremely high temperatures. Very, very challenging. We've learned a lot on this well, and actually this is an FMI for one particular zone that uh, we are treating in this well. Um, so we drilled the well, did a couple of logging runs, or did a couple of core runs in the well to recover core, standard logging measurements, and for those people that aren't familiar with it, an FMI log is a reconstruction of the circumference of the well bore that is made by electrical measurements. And so the black areas are designating fractured zones, and uh, the uh, orange, orange and brown areas are, are delineating, delineating hard granite. And remarkably, there were quite a number of fractures in, in, in this well. And so the logging campaign is measured tremendous, to, I'm almost there, tremendous opportunities um, ha have come forward. We just finished in situ testing on this well to determine the in situ stresses. And probably for the first time in 40 years in a geothermal well, we pumped propent. Now, you know, this was 200 mesh propent in a very small volume, but uh, we'll, take, we'll take any sort of credit we can get. Okay, so we do have something with um, a lot of um, positive outcomes, learning about bit mechanics, the lithologies, delineating this stuff, providing information for numeric, numerical modeling. And so the next stage then, this is a vertical well that we drilled, the next stage, presuming that we get it, will be to drill these two horizontal wells, fracture between them, and set up um, a geothermal laboratory that is, that is something like this. This will be, the next phase of this project will be about $150 million. Probably $60 million in drilling and infrastructure and fracturing and whatever, and then the rest of the money will be allocated to uh, hydraulic fracturing or, by, or testing of tools or whatever. It will be DOE. Department of Energy funding for research. And I think I've run out of time, um, and I appreciate uh, um, your attention. Thank you very much.